The provisions you've made, 1.8 billion, that's probably not going to be the last. You were very clear in the news conference that prudence is the key word. But how big could the potential losses be for Bundesbank? Well, that depends, of course, on the interest rate path you assume. But uh, we think that with the provisioning that we started now, we are taking a conservative approach. And this means that there will be further provisioning uh, next year. And these provisions are for interest rate risk that we didn't have in our balance sheet uh, before. But because of the asset purchase program and some other policies, the size of our balance sheet has increased uh, quite considerably. And also the structure of the balance sheet has changed, and that's what we are uh, um, provisioning for. Would it be prudent of the market to assume then a similar amount of provisioning may come through next year if the path doesn't change aggressively and the market doesn't assume that it will this year? I'm not sure how interested you are in our provisions, but uh, if you would like to forecast, I think it will be a similar step with respect to interest rate uh, provisions. But of course, we also provision for other uh, forms of risks, like credit risks, and the sum of all those risks might, of course, change over the next year. You channeled Eve Mersch in, in your news conference. You referred to his comments, which were about the ECB should make communication symmetrical, more symmetrical. When, in your opinion, is it appropriate to lobby for a shift in the language at the European Central Bank? You know, I think two points with respect to that uh, question. First of all, as you know, uh, we had a discussion in December uh, last year to extend the asset purchase program. And given the, interest, uh, the, the outlook for uh, inflation and also the balance of risk uh, and benefits for especially the sovereign bond uh, purchases, um, I was not very supportive of that step. So the monetary policy stance that uh, I would have been willing to accept is uh, less expansionary than the current, uh, the current one. That's, uh, that's first. Second, uh, of course, the governing council uh, has to ensure a certain consistency in its announcements. So there are decisions mm -hmm. uh, there. But we also have to uh, acknowledge that, uh, of course, we do face a slight uh, change uh, in our forecast in the sense uh, that the balance of risk might be more favorable uh, today than it was before. Um, and those balance of risk can change. The biggest risk, you, you, you talk about new risks as well during the news conference. What is the biggest new risk in, in your view? Is it Trumponomics? No, no, I mean the balance of risk in a positive sense, okay. in, in, in the sense that I think the global economy, but as well the uh, economies of the euro area, have shown a certain robustness vis-à-vis uh, uh, -vis, uh, surprises uh, that we felt before were risks to our forecasts. Uh, and we believe uh, that the upswing that we have already uh, seen before will continue. And that means, of course, also that domestic price pressures will increase over the forecast horizon. Um, one of the things when we were just chatting before we started, um, I said, look, I want to chat to you about the capital key, the adjustment in the capital keys. And you said, look, Manus, that's actually quite, quite small. But there is a concern out there in the marketplace. Jonathan and I have been chatting about this, which is, I suppose, a squeeze in terms of short dated paper, shorter maturities in German government bonds in the Schatz area. Does this shift in the capital key ease the pressure on the Bundesbank? Will it ease the pressure on the shortage of paper available in the market? And what eases the pressure uh, on us in implementing uh, the APP or the PSPP in that regard is the decision that we also buy shorter now and that we can buy below deposit uh, facility rate. That's, I think, the main uh, changes uh, that allow us to implement the program uh, as uh, decided. That's, uh, that's for one. The other uh, parameters that limit the purchasable universe uh, of the program, I think, are pretty important to ensure the necessary distance uh, to monetary financing. That regards the capital key, uh, but it also holds uh, for the issuer and issuance limits uh, that we uh, decided. A classic question, which, which I will try and prize out of you. The market assumes that there will be a rate hike in 2019. So I put it to you that the market is behind the curve in regards to where we might get with ECB uh, rate policy. Is, is that too simplistic of you? I would say these expectations don't sound absurd. So it's in the possibilities that I see. But I don't comment on market forecasts uh, 
as you know. Okay, well, we'll park that there. We have uh, the world of G20 descending on Baden-Baden. Um, I just wonder, is that G20 going to be uh, the turf war of currency wars uh, in 2017? My assumption would be no. We are looking forward to get to know our new uh, colleagues from the U.S. We are eagerly listening uh, to what they have to say. But apart from that, of course, the German G20 presidency has its own uh, agenda. As you know, it's composed of sustainable growth, uh, managing the digitalization, but also ensuring investment in, in Africa. So there, there's plenty to discuss uh, in Baden-Baden, and uh, our new colleagues are one aspect uh, that we're looking forward to. What is the biggest wild card? Um, Grey Swan, Black Swan, what is your biggest wild card? Is it something from the Trump administration and its economics? I mean, lambasi in the euro is, is, is one approach. Um, or is it Italy? Where is the biggest scale of risk for you? Uh, I, I never do compare risks in a, in a sense. I mean, I, I stressed also in the press conference uh, that uh, open markets are in all our interests. So a competitive uh, environment, competitive markets uh, are key for our well-being. Of course, we perhaps have neglected the negative side effect uh, in the past and have to explain better, have to cope with them. Yes. That's, that's one one aspect. Uh, but then uh, uh, this is also part, of course, of the G20 discussion, to, to form that consensus about the, let's say, benefits of free trade. Uh, and uh, um, so I see this not as a risk, but I see it as a chance. Um, we also heard from you very clearly, uh, as I would expect from, from a central banker, say, I don't get involved in, in a view uh, in terms of what might happen in France. I just wonder, one, one or two people said this to me, when you sit down with Dr. Weidman, could you ask him this? Is Marine Le Pen an existential threat to the euro, her potential accession to power? Is that an existential threat to the euro? No, I'm a central banker, so my main concern is to ensure price stability. I'm not an expert com commentator on political outcomes, and I'm not second-guessing political outcomes, nor do I uh, comment the programs of political parties. Okay. We will cope with all that. Uh, we will cope with the next French government, and I'm sure that it's one that is uh, open towards Europe, that is friendly towards Europe, and that is supporting the common currency. Could I ask you then, uh, Dr. Weidman, whether you see the need for extraordinary measures between various central banks as a potential risk management running up to the French elections, as you did with Brexit, Governor Carney, uh, I'm sure was in touch with you, there were various measures taken. Is it prudent to expect central banks to communicate in, in, in some kind of way that we are prepared for a worst possible outcome? You can assume that uh, we are always prepared uh, to cope with uh, emergencies, but I don't feel uh, it would be necessary nor appropriate to preemptively react to potential political outcomes. That would be a strange monetary policy. Well, not, not so much in terms of policy, but to reassure markets, I suppose, that the access to swap lines would be the, the same kind of preparedness for, for top, rough and tumble times. Markets can assume that we are prepared. Markets can assume that you're prepared. The one thing that, uh, obviously, from where I sit, I sit in the London vantage point, and I, I'm interested to know the great debate at Davos was where would the banks relocate themselves? Will it be Madrid? Will it be Frankfurt? Will it be Paris? You have the weight of the German administration on your shoulders. Is Frankfurt, do you really want to have that level of balance sheet risk transfer into Germany if the bankers decide to come here as a tour de force? Excuse the, sort of, the, the, the French and the German bit together there. You know, Frankfurt is an attractive uh, place. I think Frankfurt has a lot uh, to offer, and we, of course, also welcome uh, 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 the banks. But I think the realistic view on all this will be that banks will relocate to some extent, and they will relocate throughout the whole euro area. So it's not only to Frankfurt vis-à-vis -vis Paris or Madrid. It will, you will find different decisions in different banks. So uh, there will be, uh, if you see this from a risk perspective, also a certain spreading uh, of, of that. But I don't see uh, this business as a risk. That's why we're here to regulate uh, the business. And regulate well.